Praise the Lord. I welcome you again to our Bible study. It's a time we look into the Word of God so that we can be what God wants us to be, enter the narrow way, and be able to make it to heaven. From the inception, we did mention we are studying for this time from one of our books titled The Abiding Life in Christ. We have looked at life outside Christ, that a lot of people are living their lives without Christ. Even though they go to church, their names are written in the church register. Some of them even take communion, holy communion in their churches. They are communicants, but they are not candidates because their a life that they are living is outside the grace of God, is outside the commandment and, and dictates of the word of God. They are living outside Christ. That's why we are studying to see how we will come to Calvary, that our lives will be purged, cleansed, and then we remain in that experience. Let's read one of our texts we've been reading since we began. We are looking at John, Gospel according to St. John, chapter 1, verse 4. It says, In him, in Christ, was life. And the life was the light of men. That if you want meaningful life, life that we transcend and get you into eternity with life is domiciled. That life can only be found in Christ, which means outside Christ is dead. Outside Christ will be crisis. Outside Christ will be rejection. So when you need that life that is, is only found in Christ, then you have to come inside him. So we have looked at the life outside Christ. Then we have also looked at entering into Christ's kingdom. How do we live the abandon, the life without Christ, and enter into Christ's kingdom in order to be partaker of this life? And we studied that already in our last study. Today we are making progress in our study. And we are looking at the abiding life. Having entered into the kingdom, we need to abide. We need to remain. And consistently be in him in order to please God. Why is this necessary? Bible says in Romans in chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Meaning, we were not born as saints. We were not born without sin. David said in Psalm 53, in sin did my mother conceive me. So, we were born in sin. And so we lived in sin, we grew up with sin. It's just like, we are just like fish that was, that spends all its life in the sea. In the sea of sin. That is what human being was made of. Look at it again. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read from verse 45. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last man was made a quickening spirit. How be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from above. So you see from where we are reading, that how be it, it, the, it was not first spiritual. We are not first born spiritual. We are not first born saints. We were born sinners, naturally in sin. So, everybody who is a human being needs this message. Every 
anybody who wants to get to heaven ha needs this transformation experience. And for him to remain, the first thing that came for every human being, irrespective of your religion, irrespective of um, the money you give out, irrespective of your academic qualification and how you know disciplined you are, you are first and foremost a sinner. Let this sink deep. That how be it that was not first, which is spiritual. You are not first holy. You are not born righteous. You were not born a spiritual person. You were first a sinner. Then something must happen to turn you from the life of sin to the life of a saint. That's why he said, and afterward, that which is spiritual, who we are natural, born in sin, conceived in sin, born in sin, grew. But good news, Jesus came with grace. Jesus came with mercy. Jesus came with his cleansing blood. Jesus came as one to reconcile and bring us back to God, that we will live from that position of being in sin, of born in sin, living in sin, and the transformation will take place that will bring us into him. He will then transform and translate us into the kingdom, into his own kingdom. So we see that it is then when we became saved, we enter into his kingdom. Then the question now is, what do we do? We are to abide in that experience. Remain in that experience. In John chapter 15, and uh, we are reading from verses 1, 2 to 8. We've been studying this um, um, passage for the past um, two studies, and we are still continuing in it. I'm reading now John chapter 15. I read from verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me, we have explained it, you must be in Christ. You are the branch of the vine, why Jesus himself is the true vine. And you are just joined. You, are, you grew out when you become saved. If you give your life to Christ, you grow out from him. And, which means your source of supply and sustenance in your Christian experience is your continuous attachment to him. Once you are cut off, you will die spiritually. And my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he removes, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, he cleanses it, he manures it, he releases more grace to it, so that it will bring forth more fruit. Now, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me. Now you are coming to him, don't go out. The Christian life is not a hit and run affair. It is a continuous fellowship, a continuous union, a continuous um, interaction with Jesus the Savior. They say, abide, remain in me. Don't go out. Don't take leave. And I will remain Branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except you abide in me. I am the vine, in verse 5. You are the branches. He that abided in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, without Christ, you can do nothing. Without Christ, you religiously, you can do nothing. You cannot get to the Father. Without Christ, you cannot make it to heaven on the last day. Without Christ, you cannot escape hell. Without Christ, you cannot have the power to say no to the devil. Say, without me, you can do nothing. 
If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be what? My disciples. So this parable recorded by John, Jesus is teaching his hearers and his followers and his disciples his union with his followers. He's teaching his disciples that there's a union between him and those that are following him. Thus, encouraging you know, that there should be mutual love, submission, and continuous dependence on him. That we cannot cut off, we cannot be independent and achieve anything without him saying, I am the true vine. Which means there is a false vine. There are deceivers. If you want the truth, say, I am the way. The life and the truth. I am the true vine. He is pointing to the fact that there are many fake and false vines who will never be dependable and trustworthy. He alone is the true vine from whom the living water and the sap that will nourish our life can come. The father is the husband man. All sincere followers of Christ are encouraged, commanded to remain attached to Jesus just as the branch is attached to the tree for that branch to bear fruit. It means any branch that is cut off from the main tree, from the stem of the tree, will be denied of the sap and, and nutrient that comes from the root and that branch will die. It cannot grow. It will die of itself. The same way any human being, any believer, or a backslider, a compromiser, or an evil pen that feels, I can't, I can do without Christ, I remove myself, I severe myself, I cut myself off from Christ, you cannot survive. Spiritually, you cannot survive. That is why we must take this study very, very seriously. We are looking at two, three things before we pray. Number one is the command to abide in Christ. It's a commandment. The word command is a military language. And every military language is to be obeyed. It is not a suggestion that if you like, I take it. If I don't like, I throw it away. No, it's compulsory. So, there is a command given to the disciples and given to the followers who have been attached to Christ through genuine repentance and sin power in the blood. Through the sacrifice of Christ on the cross of Calvary and their, their names enter the book of life, they are now attached to Christ through genuine salvation. They are now commanded, you just began a journey. It is not the end. Commanded to remain in the vine. Then, two, we look at the condition to abide. Having been commanded, and you are to abide in that vine in Christ, there are conditions. You must fulfill, you must meet. Because when you come in, you are not supposed to do anything you like. The, live the way you like, say the things you like, go to where you like, dress the way you like, eat the things you like. No, there are conditions for abiding Christians to fulfill. And they will be looking at what are the consequences. Suppose one decides to say, I'm not ready for all these do's and don'ts. I'm not ready, I'm not a zombie, I don't want anything and anybody to, you know, teleguide me, to watch me, to dictate to me. I'm a free moral agent. Yes, you're a free moral agent. The choice is in your hand to make. But I want to let you know that there are consequences for your actions. Because action and reaction, they're equal and opposite. 
they, when you take a decision and you damn the consequences, be sure that you will give account one day. So we are looking at first the command to abide in Christ. In John chapter 15, look at it again in verse 4. Abide in me is not a suggestion. It's a command. Abide in Christ and I and Christ will abide in you is a definite command you have been given. Look at John chapter 8. In verse 13, Gospel according to St. John chapter 8, I read from verse 13. And he, as he spake this words, many believed on him. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, he was preaching, he was teaching, he was giving them the rules. He was giving them the, the rules of the kingdom and telling them that their old method and pattern of life must be done away. And now they are following him. He was sharing to them that he is the Savior who has come to save them from their sin. And as he was speaking those words and teaching them the words of eternal life, many of them believed on him. But, and then, did he tell them congratulations? You have done well? No, he now told said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. He said, it's good you have believed, but that's not the end of the matter. If you continue in my word, he told them, there is the need to continue. It's not enough to raise your hand in the crusade and say, I'm, uh, yes, I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm gave, I want to be born again. After the crusade, what follows? Do you go back to your old lifestyle? You go back to where you have been chewing tobacco and you are still drinking. You go back to that beer parlor where you are drinking and you are drunk. Or you go back to your old immoral friends. You go back to the woman or the lady that have been committing immorality and committing abortion with after raising hand in the crusade. And you go back home into sin. No. He said, if you continue in my word, which means there has to be a clear, you know, Drop. There has to be a clear difference. Separation. That if you continue in my word, then it is only then. That means if you don't continue, even though you go to that crusade and the greater preacher of our time preaches and you raise your hand, you answer what I call, but you go back into your sin, you are not his disciple. You are not following him. You are not abiding in him. It is only when you continue in the word of God, it is then I hear my word, my disciples indeed. That is when you are really, really the disciple of Jesus Christ. And you shall know the truth. As you keep in the word of God, the word of God will continue to teach you the truth about life. Teach you the truth about heaven. Teach you the truth about hell. Teach you the truth about marriage. Teach you the truth about one man, one wife. Teach you the truth about righteousness and true holiness. And teach you the truth of without compromise with the world. Teach you the truth on how to overcome temptations and, uh, and discard and cast away devil and deny the works of hidden works of unrighteousness. It is then you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. We make you free from sin. You live holy. You, the truth will make you to live free from sin. The truth will make you to live free from evil. The truth will make you to live free from what the generality of people are living. Their lifestyle, you, the truth will make you to be free from it. Then are you his disciples indeed. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Turn your Bibles with me. We are looking at the command. As of the Apostles, chapter 13, and I'm reading verse 43. In the Apostles, chapter 13, it says, Now, when the congregation was broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them. 
to continue in the grace of God. Paul has gone to preach in company of Barnabas, and they preach to a congregation. And after preaching to them, and the service have ended, the many of the Jews, and then religious proselytes, the Greeks, and those who are not Jews that have, that have given their life to Christ and have repented and are turning from idol worship into the worship of the true God. They are the proselytes. They, all of them, they followed Paul and Barnabas. And they were not telling them congratulations for this decision. It said, yes, that's a good step, number one. But there's step is to continue in the experience that you have got. Who speaking to them, persuaded them, pleaded with them, you know, talked to them, encouraged them, exhorted them to continue in the grace of God. That same exhortation is coming to you today. That same persuasion is coming to you today. That uh, same pleading is coming to you as you are listening to the word that you need to continue in the grace that has brought you into the fold. To the fold of Christ, to the fold of the gospel, to the fold of righteousness, you must not abandon that grace or take it for granted. You are to continue in it. Acts chapter 14, verse 22. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 14, verse 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith exercise in Christ and you are born again. Continue in it. That faith you exercise on the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary and you gave your life to Christ, continue in it. That faith you exercise in the cleansing power in the blood of Jesus. You look, say, look unto me, all you the ends of the earth and be ye saved. You looked unto him and that blood he shed on the cross of Calvary cleansed your sin. Removed everything Continue in that faith, don't drop it. The, to continue in the faith, and that we must through much tribulations enter into the kingdom of God. You know what he's saying? Yes, you have given your life to Christ. Yes, you have exercised your faith on Christ's uh, sacrifice on the cross of Calvary. Your sins have been washed. Your name has entered the book of life, but tribulation is there. Persecution is there. Don't allow the persecution to take you away. To take you away from the kingdom. You must remain and continue despite difficulty, despite the mockery, despite the persecution, despite the hardship and the deniers, despite the challenges that will be associated by the life of holiness. Continue. It is like when you, you give your life to Christ, the things you used to do, you do them no more. And your friends, your sinful partners, they may come to call you, let's go to a normal joint to go and um, smoke Indian hemp and, and smoke uh, cocaine and smoke uh, all those things. Say, no, I, I gave my life to Christ two days ago. My life is changed. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. I'm a new creature now. All things that I invite you, including those who are inviting me to come and do, they are passed away. They will make mockery. They will laugh at you. They will make jest of you. Maybe there are those I do worship to native doctors to get chance and they call you as usual. Say, you know, uh, you need to go and renew your protection. You say, no. The name of the Lord now is a strong tower. Christ has made me righteous through his blood. I run into it, I am saved. My faith is built on nothing less but on Christ, on his blood and his righteousness. All other ground now is sinking sand. I'm st stand with Jesus, they will mock at you. They will threaten you. They will say, that gang you belong to, you must not come out. You must not leak a secret. All of us must remain in this gang and die in it. And you say, no, because you have been saved. Tribulation will come. Hatred will come. Mockery will come. Denial will come. But you need to stand your ground. You need to remain in that faith and tell them, no, I'm not going back to you. The Bible has given unto us. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
I am reading from verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 3, I read from verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my goal, my faith, my long-suffering, my patience, my charity. You have also fully known my persecutions, my afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconum and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured. Paul, who was confirming their soul and was exhorting them, went through the same tribulation and said they knew very well his own persecutions, his own uh, afflictions, which came to him in various places and towns and cities he had gone, in Iconium, in, Lyst in uh, Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all. Hey, and all that must, all that we live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men, unrepented men, evil men, irreligious men, evil men who are not ready to go to heaven, Evil men who are agents of the devil. Evil men who were planted by Satan and Lucifer. But evil men and seducers shall wash worse and worse. Why people are getting saved and they are seeing their colleagues giving their life to Christ and they are living the Christian life. Evil men will be washing worse in their sin. Washing worse in wickedness. Not even thinking of how to repent. Which but evil men and seducers shall wash worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. They, they are deceiving people, and they themselves are deceived by devil and those that gain his godliness, thinking that what they do for the devil will get them a place in eternity. Of course, it will get them a place in eternity in hellfire, but not in heaven. In verse 14, but what of you? As evil men are getting worse and worse, what should the believer do? As bad people are refusing to repent, should you go and join them? No. If they insist in unrighteousness, they insist in not changing, they insist in continuous life of sin, you, who is a believer, insist on continuous righteousness. If they ref evil men refuse to change, why should they believe a believer, a righteous man, a saint, a compromise and change. No, he said, but thou, you that is born again, continue thou in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. If when you see in sin, colleagues and, the, and gang people re refusing to repent, you yourself refuse to join them. Refuse to go back to the uh, Broadway, refuse to compromise, refuse to be a sinner, refuse to continue in the same way. If they will not change, why should you change? Why should I change? Why should the Christian change? Why should we be the object of compromise? Why should he be the believer who is on the narrow way that we leave the narrow way and go to the Broadway? If they want to continue in the Broadway, good luck to them. But let me, let you, let us continue on the narrow way that leads to life eternal. I pray we will take such a stand. That's the command the Bible has given unto us. And I'm trusting God that we will take this command very, very seriously. Then, how do we continue and abide in him? Abide, every branch, abide in me, and I abide in you. Every branch in me, Christ brings his followers into an intimate, lasting relationship because you as a branch is in him. So there is a relationship that, we, that is permanent, a relationship that is continuous, a relationship that is will ultimately last. The branch must, of necessity, be firmly attached right inside Christ for it to survive. It shows that outside Christ, survival is impossible. This is why the command came to everyone, abide in me, so I can also abide in you. 
the attachment is interwoven and intertwined. Christ and Christ is in you. So there is a continuous flow in and out. You may want to mean in and out. I mean a continual relationship from Christ to you, from you to Christ. And so that life is consistent and continuous. And you remain and retain the identity of Christ. As you enter into that union, then you have to continue in the conditions for that abiding. Come back to me. Come back with me, sorry, to John chapter 15. Let's get back to our text in John chapter 15. And I'm reading verse 2 to 5. Con condition for abiding in Christ. John chapter 15. I read from verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh it. Beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that he may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean. Through the word which I have spoken unto you, abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine. And ye, the believer, who is now in Christ, you are the branches. He, the branch, he that abided in me, the believer is, that is abiding in Christ, and Christ is abiding in him, the same will bring forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do what? Nothing. Without Christ, there's nothing you can do. It talks about consistency. In fruit bearing, Look at something in verse 2. If you are abide in Christ, it says you will bring forth more fruit. That's the later part of verse 2. Then go to verse 5. As you continue to abide in Christ con consistently, uh, as we read, you will bring forth much fruit. So we see it, that is in verse 5. And it says, He that abided in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. Can you see how the growth and relationship and intimacy is getting closer and closer and closer and closer? When you get saved, you begin to bear the fruit of righteousness, the fruit of holiness, the fruit of the spirit. Then, the more you continue to abide, you are not, you are not bearing, you go beyond bearing more fruit and then you go get to bearing much fruit that's what we see in verse 5 he that abided in me and I in him the same bringeth forth what much fruit look at it again in verse 8 herein is my father glorified that you bear what much fruit in verse 2 more fruit in verse 5, verse 8, much fruit. When you are in, uh, 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 in verse 1 and verse 2, you bear fruit. You bear more fruit, you bear much fruit. So we see that you are, the, the believer in Christ is not stagnant. He's always on the increase. He's always making progress. He's always growing. He's always getting closer and closer. The inner you go, the more fruit you bear relationship in your interaction with Christ, the more fruitfulness you will be bringing. So, more, more interaction, more days, more relationship, much, much, much more fruit. Every time you will be bearing fruit in Christ. Hebrews chapter 3. Turn your Bibles with me. Hebrews chapter 3. We are looking at the condition for Abiding in Christ. Hebrews chapter 3. And I'm reading from verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house. Whose house are we? 
if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. Do you see the condition that is there? Yes, that Jesus as the Son over the house of God, the Son over the of our salvation, is the eternal one, is the Savior, he is the one, is the true vine. Then he said, we can be part of that, of that house, on one condition. That is, if we hold fast, if we hold firm, if we hold our experience tenaciously, if we hold our relationship with him consistently, continually, unto the end, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, strong, firm, unto the end, not halfway, not, not weakly, not just, uh, you know, seasonal, during the time of Easter, and you want to do the uh, Passover, and you want to remember the sufferings of Christ, and you felt, let me be pious for the time. Not the, the time you want to pray and fast, and because you have a need, and there are things you are looking from God, then you excuse yourself from sin. When you pray and you get what you are looking for, you go back into sin. No. The life of holiness is a continuous, consistent life. You must hold your confidence, you must hold your experience consistently, continuously, strong and firm until the end in verse 7. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my words, 40 years, wherefore I was grieved with that generation. When they came, they heard about the deliverance of them in Egypt, they were happy. They cleansed themselves, they followed the, the instructions, and they did the Passover, and they came out of Egypt. But before they got to the promised land, they went into idol worship. They donated their earrings and they made a calf, and they said, Aaron, as for Moses and his gods, we know them know again, where, what is become of them. Make us gods that we will see. They went back in their hearts into Egypt to practice the idolatry of Egypt. Are you, young lady, because of marriage? Say, I've been praying for God to give me a husband. The husband is not forthcoming. Therefore, you decide to go back to your old boyfriend. You decide to go back to your old girlfriend. I said, so sorry, I made a mistake. I don't know what entered me. You didn't know what entered you when you gave your life to Christ. That's why you are going back into Egypt. Because of the cucumber. Because of the little, little things you get. No, you shouldn't go back into that journey. This is what happened to the, to the children of Israel. But the Bible is saying today, if you will hear his voice, you backslider, you will hear the voice, you should come back. I was in many years ago, was talking to a man, and he just patted me at the back and said, my young man, we, I was like you in 1962. But see it, since that time, Christ, they told us, is coming, has not come. If I continue like that, I wouldn't have reached where I, end, uh, I am now. Where is he today? He ended up in misery. He ended up a backslider. You end up a sinner in hell. That's why he said, Harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me. Yes. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. May God not be grieved over you. May the angels of God not grieve over your life. May the church of Christ not cry because of your backsliding and lukewarm state. May believers not be coming from your house and they be shaking their head and say, this thing, ah, that bro has gone far. May you not, may, may not be said of you in Jesus' name. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, 
they do always err in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my rod, they shall not enter into my rest. Verse 12, take heed. Be cautious. That is the condition. When you end coming, Christ, don't live, be, don't be frivolous. Don't take things for granted. Don't say, I'm not born again. You have a license to do anything. No. Deceives a lot of people. I'm born again now. I cannot fall. Therefore, you can visit the opposite sex as, as, a, as a single brother. You are going to a single lady in the night, alone, by 12 midnight. And you say, ah, it's already late. I, I had a story of this lady. And then this young man came to his house, came to her house. And then she had, she even went out of the way to go and cook for this man. And the man was eating the lady's left off uh, outside. He gave some him, him food inside the house and came outside to sit down. And the man finished eating, also lay on the bed. By the time the lady was waking up, that was around 1, 2 a.m., he said it's late now to go, to, to go home. As he just entered, struggle, struggle, they committed the immorality, it led to pregnancy. Unfortunately, that lady never knew that she became, that one night resulted in pregnancy. Everything, all the testimony, they have in the fellowship, everything crashed to the ground. That's why you must be cautious. Take heed, brethren. Let there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God, departing from the experience of salvation, departing from the experience of holiness and righteousness, departing from the experience of standing on the word of God. Be careful, but exhort one another daily why it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Sin can be deceitful. The devil can deceive. Friends and peers can deceive you. Christ, when do we, what do we do to remain and partake of Christ's experience? Look at it in verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. We read it in verse 6. We read it again in verse 14. If you hold the experience of your salvation, that day you said, all to Jesus surrender. All to him I freely give. He is my savior. He is my sanctifier. He is my Lord. He is my owner. I give all to him. Good. But hold it fast. Don't hold it with loose hands. Hold that confidence, that confession, that decision you have made. Hold on to it. The beginning of that confidence, hold it fast unto the end. Until the rapture or by death you make him in the Christian life. Let me take permission and go to the world. Many years ago in the 80s, we were in fellowship. And the man felt um, one of our brethren um, offended him. And then he was telling people, he's going to take permission from Christ to backslide so that he will fight with that uh, brother that offended him. After fighting and beating the brother, he will come back. Salvation is your personal property. Are you the one that gave it to yourself? And unfortunately, that man baslid and went far, far away from Christ. We tried to follow up, follow up. He went to so many things I cannot say now. Only God knows he lasted before his death. Because I'm a now. But only Christ we I heaven we say this was his last state. That permission, he said, let me take permission and backslide. It, it, for 10 years and much more than 10 years, he was out of Christ. May that not be your experience in Jesus' name. Hebrews 
chapter 10, verse 22. Paul's um, epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 10, and I'm reading verse 20, 22. And turn your Bibles with me. So let's read together Hebrews 10. I read from verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Keep coming near to Christ, near to Christ, so that you'll be, you'll be bearing fruit, bearing more fruit, bearing much fruit. You see, fullness. You begin to bear fruit, then you continue to bear more fruit. As you continue to deep, the deeper in Christ you are, the more fruit you bear. The deeper in Christ you are, in, in, you, you go in experience, the much, much more fruit you are. That's what I say, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. The profession of our faith without wavering. Hold it tenaciously, strongly. Don't allow anything to remove your salvation from you or to cut you off from your experience with Christ. If you have seen monkeys, I watched a, a video. A man, you know, brought very good bananas and put it inside on the windscreen, inside on the dashboard, and then wine his glass just came from the bush and came on top of the windscreen. They were struggling to remove the banana. The windscreen was transparent, so they are seeing the banana, but they could not, their hand could not pass through. You try to push them away, they refused. They were struggling for that banana, and somebody will come and catch the monkey. They will now, another one will come on it, he will be struggling to collect that banana, and then they will come and catch the monkey. What am I saying? The way monkeys hold tenaciously to banana, hold your experience like that. Hold your salvation like that. Hold your holiness, your conversion, and the work of grace tenaciously. Don't allow anything to remove it from you until Christ comes to pick you. Either it comes by death to take you to heaven, or it comes by rapture to take you to heaven. Don't allow anything to make you lose that experience. That's why he's saying, verse 3, profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. God, who promised us eternal life in Christ, is faithful. He cannot change. God, who promised us mansions in heaven, is faithful. He will not deceive us. God, who promised us this, that we walk in the streets of God, is a faithful God. He has said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I don't deceive people. I'm not a deceiver. I would have told you that there's nothing you will get here when you come up to the other side of eternity. But because there is something you must get, that's why I am making that faithful promise to you. Hold on to your salvation experience. I pray you will not lose it. And then in verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves, but exhorting one another, and much more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully after you have been saved, after the grace of God has worked on you, after your name has been written in the book of life, and instead of you to consider to continue your experience of salvation, you will now go back into sin and begin to do the, the bad things again and refuse to repent and continue to re remain in it, then you are crucifying the Lord the second time. And you are now denying the Lord that saved you. And that is why you must live the life of Christ. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. Here the scripture clearly points out that there's a condition for abiding in Christ and it's for the believer to bear fruit. What kind of fruit is God requiring from us? From me, he's looking from you, he's looking from his children, good fruit. Because by their fruit, you shall know them. 
Then they include the fruit of holiness, the fruit of the spirit, the fruit of converse, sincere worship and thanksgiving unto God, peaceable fruit unto righteousness. As the husbandman will remove every unfruitful branch from the vine, so will the father remove every unfruitful member from the body of Christ, that is the church. You may be in the physical church, local church, but your, you, your name will not be in the church of the firstborn in heaven. Your name will not be in the book of life in heaven because it is written clearly in Revelations in chapter 22. Take a um, look at Revelations chapter in verse 15, it says, For without, outside the kingdom of God, are dogs and sorcerers and warmongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh what? A lie. In chapter 21 of uh, Revelation, verse 27, And there shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God, into eternity with Christ, anything that defies. If your life is defiling as a lady, as a man, you are defiling yourself, then you are, you are disqualified from enter, um, entering into heaven. Anything that defileth, neither whatsoever walketh abomination. You are in the church, physical church, in a local church, but your lifestyle, your character, your conduct, is for a man to come into the church of God and you are defiling members of the choir. You tell, tell us you are a choir mistress, you are a choir brother, and you can sing and, and as an angel, and you are you are sleeping with the ladies in the in that choir. That's an abomination. You left the halos in the hotel. You left the unbeliever that are worshipping idol and worshipping Satan, you left them in, in the world, is in the church you are coming to commit immorality. It's an abomination. You are walking abomination. The highway is there where robbers are stealing. The banks are there. The markets are there. The world is there where thieves are stealing. And you leave stealing in the world and you come to church to be stealing offering money. That's an abomination. It's an abomination for anybody, whether you're a preacher, whether you're an usher, no matter the title they give you, and you're a chief. Carrot. I want to let you know that Judas, the thief in, among the twelve, didn't make heaven. How can a thief in the church get to heaven? How can a, a Jezebel get to heaven? How can a moral person in the church get to, with all the preaching, with all the study, with all the counseling, with all the warning, and you are in the church and you are living in sin, pretending to be holy like us, and showing the kind of dress that we show, and then we think you are part of us, but you are an agent of the devil, you are walking abomination. You are abominable. Your character is abomination. You are planted by Antichrist. And Bible says, and whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they, only they, who are who, which are written in the Lamb's book of life, will make heaven. That is why you must run away from sin. If you want to live in sin, my counsel to you is go to the world. The Broadway is there. There is accommodation for you in the world. There's accommodation for you in the broad way. You want to continue to live in sin. You want to go to native doctor. There's accommodation for you. Once you come, they will tell you your, your vacancy is there. Go and fill it up. But if you come to the body of Christ, then you must live righteous. You must live holy. You must live a life that is pleasing unto him. You shouldn't be living the life in Babylon, in Zion. You shouldn't bring the world into the church. You shouldn't bring the last time of the world into the church to corrupt the body of Christ. All those unbelieving Jews, Judas, leading disciples, and four professing Christians, 
who are merely attached to Christ not by word, but not in life, will not bring glory to God. Abide in me means to hold fast your faith and good conscience and let no trials turn you aside from the truth. He promises to give us every help and influence that we, we require in order to persevere unto eternal life with Christ. We can, without me, you can do nothing. Separated from Christ, you can do nothing at all. We remain helpless and powerless without Christ. We must always remember that God can do without man, but man cannot do without God. It is impossible for a branch to live, thrive, and bring forth fruit when it is cut off from the tree from which it, it, from which it only drives its juice. That is why we must remain in him. Then we are concluding this um, part of the study today by looking at the consequences of not abiding in Christ. Suppose somebody says, I don't care. What they are saying is not for me. He entered through this ear. He goes out through the other one. What they say, it doesn't concern me. I suppose there are, there are people who are saying, I'm still young. I need to live the life of a youth. I want to enjoy my life. When I finish, then I will think of what they are saying as if tomorrow is in your hands. What are the consequences to such a decision? Yes. John chapter 15. Turn their Bibles with me to John chapter 15. And I'm reading in verse 6. If a man, if a woman, if a boy, if a girl, abide not in Christ, that boy, that girl, that man, that woman, is cast out as a branch, is cut off, and is withered. Then men gather them and cast them into the fire. And they are what? They are bonds. Once the branch of a tree is cut off, that branch of the tree dies, withers away, dries up, only for to be used as firewood. It will be burnt. When you are cut off from Christ and from the source of life, you will die spiritually. And you are prepared as a firewood as a fuel that will be added into hell. I pray you will not take such condition. You will not take such a situation in Jesus' name. Second Peter chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2. I'm reading verse 15. Turn your Bibles with me to Second Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 15 through to verse 22. Verse 15 says, which have forsaken the right way and have, and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bezo, who loved the wages of what? Unrighteousness. Describing people who were once saved, whose name once entered the book of life, who once spoke in tongues, genuine speaking in tongues, who once went for evangelism, who once served God in truth and in spirit, but because of the vicissitudes and trials and challenges of life, they forsook the right way. They were following, they were on the narrow way, the right way to heaven. They abandoned it. They forsook that right way and they went astray. They began to follow the example of Balaam, the prophet that God gave instruction, but because of the wages of unrighteousness, because of the reward of divination, because of the promotion of the world, he forsook God. People, because of employment, because of getting contract, because of marriage, because of building a house, because of getting children, because of passing exam, because of getting promotion, because of getting one temporary earthly thing or not, they forsake the right way. They follow the example of Balaam, the son of Beso, and they love the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam said he will not go. But when they brought more promises, more national honor, more things that were attractive to him, 
he decided to get it. But you cannot get from the devil from one hand and get from God with, from, with the other hand. You can't be getting from both ends. No, you have to drop one. So, verse 16, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb and speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are words without water. Clouds that are carried without tempest, to whom the means of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allude through the laws of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that are clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. But if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through conversion, if after they have given their life to Christ and the blood of Jesus have washed away all the sins, remember as we began, we said we were first born in sin. We were first natural before conversion made us spiritual. After the conversion through grace has made you spiritual and you, you abandon it and you go back into that after escaping the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome and conquered. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it is happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again and the soul, the swine that was washed to her wallowing in the mare. You take a swine to the river. You wash the swine, the pig, and say, I'm taking your bath. Don't fall again. Just move the way you are moving. Before you know it, he sees death. He sees dustbin. He enters into that dustbin and dirty himself. Are you living that type of life? You have been, you have been saved. Woman, you have been saved. But adultery keep coming. And you fall into that adultery again and again. Some of you women, you have even gone to your village, did some fetish traditional things in the name of cleansing from adultery. After you have done that cleansing from adultery, so that your husband will not be will not die, are you not back into that same adultery? After you have cried and cried, God forgive me, forgive me. I will not steal church, the money again in the church. I will not steal my daddy's money again. I will not steal meat in the pot again. Are you not in that kitchen you have gone back? Have you not gone back into stealing meat in the pot? Are you not gone back into idol worship? Have you not gone back into evil and into immorality? The consequences are much. That's why I say it's better that a, a pig you are just comparable to a pig spiritually. And that is very, very bad. As of the apostles in chapter 1, see the life of Judas Iscariot, the consequences of not abiding in Christ. As of the apostles, chapter 1, and uh, we are reading from verse 15. See what the Bible says in Acts 1, verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up, in the midst of the disciples, and said, the number of the, the number of the names together were about a hundred and twenty. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs to have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us, you have been saved, you are in the number now. Your life, have, you have been converted, you are in the number now. Your name has entered the book of life, you are in the number that just like Judas Iscariot. For he was numbered with us and had obtained 
part of this ministry. He was to obtain full ministry, but he only obtained part of it. He couldn't obtain to the end. Now this man Judas purchased a field with the reward of iniquity and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst and all his bowels gushed out. He committed suicide. He killed himself. And it is known unto all the dwellers of Jerusalem in so much as the field is called in their proper tongue as Sedema. That is to say, the field of blood. He, he received a part of this ministry, but he didn't receive the entire ministry. And somebody replaced him. Look at verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein. And his bishop preak, his calling, his anointing, his position, let another take, another person take, took his position. Another person took his ministry. Another person took his reward that would have been in heaven. Remember, why they were with Christ. Peter, the apostle, asked Jesus, what shall we get after we have left all things and we have followed you? He told them in the regeneration that you will be with me in my kingdom. Just sitting with me and on the thrones and judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That of Judas became vacant. Another person took his position. I pray no man, no woman will take their position in Jesus' name. Can you see it? If Judas did not become one of the apostles, maybe he would have made heaven. If he did not go into full-time ministry, maybe he would have made heaven. Is it your service in the house of God that will take you to hell? Is it that because you are singing in the choir that will make you to go to hell? Is it because you are taking, you are the one collect part of those collecting offering and counting offering in the church? Is that what will take you to hell? Is it because you have a position in the church that will make you to go to hell? If Judas was not with them, maybe he would have made heaven now. He would have been rejoicing at the feet of Christ, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. He would have been with Peter. He would have been with David. He would have been with other apostles in heaven, rejoicing and serving God and waiting for us to come and join them. But the opportunity, the privilege of service in the house of God took him to hell. Was it not the same thing that happened to Saul, the first king of Israel? If Saul was not a king, maybe Saul would have gone to heaven. But because he took that position of leadership of the kingdom, he committed suicide like Judas. He killed himself. He went to hell. If we don't know anybody in hell, Judas is in hell. Saul, the first king of Israel, he is in hell. They took their life. What will take you to hell? That's the question. What will take a Christian, a minister, a servant of God, a worker in the house of God, what will take him to hell? From pulpit to hell. From church to hell. May it not be your portion in Jesus' name. The prophet, the young prophet from Bethlehem, Judah, he went, in, he, you see how he ended on the way. Because when he was to follow Christ and follow the instruction consistently, he became tired. I pray you will not be tired. Jesus unmistakably stated that a person who was truly united to him just as the branch is attached to the tree that produces it may unfortunately be cut off afterwards and cast into fire because he has not brought forth good fruit to the glory of God. The person who abides not in Christ in a believing, loving, and obedient way is cut off from him, having no longer any right in him and his salvation. Is cut off from Christ, and all the rights and the privileges and the authority of the believer, he loses it. Two, he is withered, deprived of all the influences of God's grace. Three, he is gathered 
through the righteous judgment of God and united again with backsliders like him and other workers of iniquity unto eternal doom and damnation. When he refuses to come back and he remains in that experience until death or until rapture, he will be gathered with other believers who never even gave their life to Christ. And they will be gathered unto doom and damnation. He is cast into the fire and separated eternally from God and, and, he, and God's eternal glory and power and from God's people to the lake of fire. He is born and eternally tormented with the devil and his angels and with all those who have lived and died in iniquity. Then, what of the years I spent as a believer? The years I spent, the Bible says in Ezekiel, if a man is righteous and he goes into sin, I say, I will not remember all that he has seen, all the righteousness he has done, but in the iniquity that he died, I will require from him. And that is why we must warn consistently, continuously, every believer, once you have come into the faith, please hold on. Hold on. See, our captain is coming. Very soon, he will come. Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 24. But when the righteous turn it away from his righteousness and committed iniquity and do it according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? All his righteousness that he has done shall not be mentioned in his trespass that he has trespassed and in his sin that he has sinned. In them shall he die. I pray you will not die in sin. After singing Hosanna in Zion, you will not die in sin in Jesus' name. Shall we bow down our heads as we pray together? The abiding life in Christ. You need to take that command and you need to hold it and keep it to the conditions so that the consequences of backsliding, you will escape from it. That you will remain in Christ. You don't Go back like Judas. You don't go back like Balaam. You don't go back like Saul, the first king of Israel. But you will remain in that experience uh, for Christ to keep you until the end. Hold fast that form of righteousness you have received. So that at the last day, you will join the church triumphant. The saints of God in singing holy, holy, Holy Lord God Almighty. Angels will say, yes, you have fought a good fight. You have kept the faith. I pray you will keep the faith in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? I want you to tell the Lord, give me grace. Forward never, backward never. Hold me, help me. I will con to continue in this experience until the end of life. I will not turn back from following you. Father, thank you for all those that are taking this decision to remain firm, steadfast in following you. I pray release more grace, that they will bear more fruit, draw them closer to you. And for those that have, you know, gone away, like Judas, like Saul, please, God, since they are still alive, in mercy, draw them to yourself. Save them again. Cleanse them like the pig. And Lord, let their names enter the book of life. I pray for that nobody listening to this study will be obstinate. We remain uh, in his life of sin. But save those who want to be saved so that they will make heaven at last in Jesus' name. I want to thank you because I know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.